one of those coffin ships, crowded onto it, not knowing whether or not we'd ever see land again. I was born Mary Harris in Cork, Ireland, baptized in the Catholic Church at North Cathedral in Cork on August 1st, 1837. My parents were Richard Harris and Ellen Cotter. They married and had five children. Before the Great Famine, Cork was a bustling city. It was beautiful. But then there was a famine, a horrible famine, where people didn't have enough to eat out in the country. And so they would come into the city trying to find food and work, and there wasn't any. And they began to die. They would fall out on the street, just like walking bones. You would see them coming and walking skeletons, and they would fall. You, you walk down the street and you'd see a bag of rags, and you'd think it was rags someone had thrown out, and it was a body. So people began to go to America and Canada, different countries, to escape the famine. Here they're waiting on the quayside, waiting for a ship, taking what they had. In the meantime, those who were in Cork, they would go to the soup kitchens. They were called soup depots. And you would get one liter of soup. Even Queen Victoria came to Cork. She was wealthy. They say that God brought the pestilence. But England brought the famine. So right in the middle of the famine, no one had any work. So my father and my older brother got on a ship, one of those coffin ships, crowded onto it, not knowing whether or not they ever see land again, and went to Canada. And they found work on a railroad in America, and then when they had made enough money, Mother Ellen took her children, her four remaining children that she had kept alive in Cork, and put them on a ship and brought them to America where she could raise them safely. Around 1851, Ellen Harris took her four children on board a ship and went to Canada to meet her husband and her oldest son. And there they lived in Toronto, where the children went to Catholic schools. And Mary got her teaching certificate. Now you know what a teaching certificate was in those days. She didn't finish her education, no, but she got a teaching certificate. It was a letter from the priest that said she was a good character and she got a job in Michigan. And there she taught her little children at a Catholic school, but she didn't like it. And the great civil war was just beginning. It was 1861 and she went to Memphis where she met her husband, George Jones, who was an iron molder. An iron molder took melted iron and poured it into molds. During the Civil War, it was a very stable life in Memphis. Our home was on Winchester Street. It was a swampy, poor part of the city. And I had four children. Afra, Elizabeth, Terence, and Mary. But in 1867, the great yellow fever struck. 
It was coming in to Memphis, and we heard that it was coming, coming up from New Orleans. But we couldn't escape. There was no place for us to go. So we had to endure it. We didn't know what was causing the yellow fever. It was mosquitoes. My four children and my husband died. And there I was, alone and penniless, with nothing left in Memphis. So I packed up and I went to Chicago, where I took up my dressmaking. But again, trouble followed me. And there was the great Chicago fire. I was just starting to get things built up. And the fire took my business and my home. Burned everything. I had nothing, nothing left. I attended meetings organized by the largest union in America, the Knights of Labor, and they influenced me. There was the Great Railroad Strike and the Haymarket Affair. I had only one goal in life, to stir up the dormant rage of the oppressed workers and help them achieve a better life for themselves and for their families to get out from under the oppression of capitalism. And let the workers rise up. There were lots of fights, but they stood strong and brave. The Knights of Labor, the largest union in the late 19th century, strong influencer in the American way of life. Children 
It said we are protected by a tarot. More school, less hospital. We want to go to school. We seek justice. And then they said that I was weak. Weak? Me? So I resigned from the union and I joined the Socialist Party in Illinois. I was one of the founding members of the IWW, Industrial Workers of the World, the Wobblies. And in 1907, I was raising funds for the Mexican revolutionaries. By 1911, I'd become frustrated with the Socialist Party and returned to the United Mine Workers. And then I became embroiled in two very desperate disputes. And they kept me in detention. But it wasn't the first time and it wouldn't be the last. They'd capture me and put me away in terrible, terrible situations. Once I was put in a basement cell with nothing to defend myself with but a beer bottle against those dirty rats. I led demonstrations through the snow in Denver, Colorado. Mount Olive sent money for shoes for the children and women in West Virginia and in Colorado. But they didn't have anything. The shoes arrived in December and the children thought it was a Christmas present. In Mexico, I met Pacho Villa and he be and I became fast friends again. The newspapers would post terrible things, how they were ousting Mother Jones, and I was in trial. I would defy the governor. But then, 500 women cheer for Mother Jones. I was very rarely out of the headlines. She didn't mind being buried with whiskey. It's what her boys would have liked. I was born in 1837 and died in 1930. I had a lovely funeral in Washington, there at St. Gabriel's Church, and Father Sweeney performed the Mass. And then they had an entire funeral car for me, loaded me on the funeral car, and brought me to Illinois, here to Mount Olive, to the Union Minor Cemetery. My funeral here was broadcast over WCFL radio out of Chicago. Thousands and thousands of people came to my funeral. And here it is, my gravesite. I didn't have a vault, but I had a fine, fine casket. And they put me in it. Here I am at the Church of the Ascension in Mount Olive. Thousands couldn't fit inside the little church. They gathered outside. They had a big parade marching out to the cemetery. 40,000 people were in that parade. In Cork, they had put in an article about my passing. It's how they broke the news to the people in Ireland. Later, after the new monument was prepared, they opened my grave and the men took me out and they opened my casket. Well, how would you like to be opened up and looked at after all those days? They said I looked just the same as when they put me in. They covered my back up, took me to my new resting place. And before that, the boys all took a little nip of whiskey and put the bottle in the casket with me and buried me. And here, there lay in the foundation for the new monument that now stands in Mount Olive at the Union Minor Cemetery. And to this day, that bottle of whiskey rests with me in my grave there in Mount Olive. She didn't mind being buried with whiskey. It's what her boys would have liked. Pray for the dead, but fight like hell for the 